What's the matter with Kansas? Remember that book from 2004? Well, now it's, they did what in Kansas? After a big majority of voters there rejected an attempt to amend the state constitution to allow for a ban on abortion. Yes, in reliably read Kansas. What's up with that? And what might it mean for the midterms? We're gonna look at that. Then, in this summer of floods, fires, and heat waves, Americans have finally come around to see climate change as a big issue. But is it too little, too late? Next, we're talking with New York Times journalist Emily Badger about the housing affordability crisis. After a year of enormous jumps in housing prices, the housing crisis isn't just about lower income Americans trying to find a place to live anymore. Finally, the heat is on, as we've been talking about. This time in the summer of 1955, we're gonna talk to our resident child of the 50s to see what he thinks about our fun fact this week. This is a big show, lots to do, so let's get to it. And hi, everybody. Welcome to Paul Hub. I'm J.D. Dapper. I'm Barbara Carvalho. I'm Mary Griffith. And I'm Lee Marengoff. We want to mention that Greta Stuckey, who is our producer, will be joining in a later segment. So stick around for that. We do want to start, though, with news this week that has really stunned a lot of people in the political world and in America in general. And that is news out of Kansas in really the first test of what Americans think about a post-Roe America, Kansas voters went to the polls for a somewhat complicated ballot initiative. In essence, what it said was, do you want to allow the state constitution of Kansas to be amended to allow the legislature to essentially outlaw abortion? And by a really big number, like it's an 18 point lead as of the counting right now, this may change, but an 18 point advantage, Kansas voters said, no, we don't want to allow the legislature to do that. We don't want to amend the constitution. Lee, big deal, right? Well, we're, oh, everybody's trying to figure out what's going to happen in the midterms and if there's any indication in some of these earlier votes and clearly whether Roe decision has altered the political landscape, but we feel clearly in Kansas, the Democrats probably haven't been as excited about things in Kansas since someone named Dorothy returned from Oz. That was a big event. Democrats are excited about that, though, or was that well, maybe I the think, independent? I think it was. But right yeah. now, Democrats are very excited about that particular moment. What's interesting is, like, bulking aside, there was a huge turnout and there was a change in the registration since June 24th, which is when the Supreme Court decision was. So, first of all, seven of 10 of the new registrants are women since that point. And Democrats enjoyed an eight point advantage in the registration over Republicans when the state is plus 19 Republicans. So if you want evidence that this is a big deal, those are the numbers. And whether this carries over to the midterms, who knows, but Democrats clearly are more enthusiastic, even in a place like Kansas, which is probably one of the least likely places to find a Democratic wave. Well, you know, we've talked a lot about public opinion on your issue of abortion and in the past. We've been polling on this issue for quite some time and have a wealth of data on how Americans feel about the particular issue. And then, you know, on the one hand, I think Kansas is surprising or took people by surprise, I should say, because of the fact that, you know, Donald Trump won the state by double digits and it has been a conservative red state for quite some time. But on the other hand, our polling has really shown that although the debate on abortion has looked very polarized, there's actually a very significant consensus among Americans on the issue. And one of the points that there is consensus on is that abortion should be legal. Now, in what circumstances it should be legal, I think is what is up for debate. But when the Supreme Court crossed that line and left that up to state legislatures and in essence made abortion illegal in many places, I think that that really raised a flag for many, many Americans. Democrats, for sure, independents significantly, but even a significant proportion of Republicans feel similarly. So I think what we're witnessing is really just a coming back to the center on the issue when the Supreme Court has moved it so far in one direction. We've seen similar changes in public opinion um, when Democrats were trying to place that issue front and center during the Obama administration. And there was discussion about perhaps Supreme Court justices moving that 
decision in the opposite direction. At that point, we saw that a majority of Americans actually identified themselves as pro-life for the first time in many years. So anytime we see this real swing to one extreme or the other, I think the opposing side needs to take notice. And Lee, certainly with the midterms around the corner, this is a very mobilizing issue. Yeah, and regardless of the public opinion on the topic, as you say, I think it speaks to mobilizing, speaks to enthusiasm, and which a Democratic Party, which was left for dead six months ago, as far as the midterms are concerned, that may have been premature because events, as we've said, do change. And this was a big one. Before we move on, I just want to point out that this is a very specific vote just on abortion. Absolutely. And that's rare. And so yeah. I think one question and one thing to watch, Lee, is does this translate into people voting for candidates? who one of the issues they want to vote on is abortion. I think that's a very different thing than an up or down vote essentially on abortion. Very, very rare in American history. And so I think there's maybe a flag or a bullet that you put on this, an asterisk maybe, about what this means. We'll see. So another um, big issue which we are keeping our eye on this time of year in particular is extreme weather. And much of the country has really been experiencing extreme weather events. And whether or not you believe in climate change and think that it is real, there's certainly no denying the fact that the weather has been challenging and in many places quite dead. We've seen the flooding in Kentucky, where at this point has killed at least 37 people, many more are missing. The McKinney Fire in Northern California grew to more than 55,000 acres in just 48 hours and killed at least four people. And of course, forced the evacuations of thousands of residents. And we also see very extreme heat alerts around the country, dangerously high temperatures uh, for the second time this summer, facing many people across the country. We've gone back and forth on a number of these issues and depending upon how the question is asked, but this also tends to be a very polarizing issue as well. What does the data look like? So yeah, Barb, so when we take a look, Americans are really keyed into the issue of climate change. According to a YouGov poll from late July, so that's just a couple weeks ago, half of Americans think the heat wave is a result of climate change. 53% of Americans, that's a majority, they believe that they have personally felt the effects of climate change 48% say that climate change in the U.S. is an emergency. 33%, however, think that there isn't an emergency. And 19% are unsure. Looking at some other numbers from that poll, that's the YouGov poll, a plurality of Americans, 43%, think we're able to avoid the worst effects of climate change, but also believe that we need a drastic change in the steps taken to tackle it. So yeah, Americans are paying attention to the issue of climate change, but it's not really top priority when we look at a survey from CBS News and YouGov that was released in April. 57% of Americans disapprove of how President Biden is handling the issue of climate change. 49% think that climate change should be addressed right now. Last year, that number was actually at 56%. And when asked what issues should be a high priority, the economy, not surprisingly, trumped all other issues with 76%. Inflation followed with 73%. Crime was among the top issues, 59%, followed by Ukraine and the situation in Russia, immigration, and lastly, climate change, which was at 39%. And Barb, as you mentioned, yes, this is a very polarizing issue. There is a partisan divide. We'll look at whether or not climate change uh, should be a high priority. 63% of Democrats think it is, 36% of independents, and 13% of Republicans. So, Lee, why is, do you think that there's this disconnect? Well, I think, you know, there's a difference between climate change and a lot of other issues we talked about in that climate change has well, sort of been around for a while. I mean, the climate's here. There's not any sudden climate event that makes us gravitate towards that, despite, you know, when you see the flooding in Kentucky, some people say, well, that's climate change. And other people say, just flooding in Kentucky. And that's a very different worldview and different perspective. I think from a scientific community standpoint, there is no doubt that the situation is getting very drastic and intervention is, is vitally important. And many would argue that it may even be getting too late as far as the polar ice cap and the resulting rise in water levels and you know, the floods and the fires and, and everything that we've been experiencing. So I think it is, you know, an issue that's sort of out there. It's sort of percolating, but it's, it's not one that gets a lot of the country focused on this in a political way that we have to start voting for people who share our views on climate change. 
But is that like the frog in the pot of boiling water? <laughs> it's happening and by the time we realize it, it's too late? Or is it generational? Maybe it's both things, but I perceive a lot of generational issues here. And the students that we work with, when we propose, we ask them to propose topics they want to write about or focus on or do segments on. And for the last three years, I can't tell you a week that's gone by without something about climate change yeah. coming up. Yeah. Well, but is just the phrase climate change just a politically polarizing phrase? And is it distracting from the actual issue of, you know, extreme weather, which I think many of us can agree upon. I think that could be very true and it can be a framing issue. I just don't know how you get people to suddenly, you know, gravitate and say, all right, we have to do something now and here's what it is. The Congress is slow to move on things. The White House is limited. And in fact, we've gone in the opposite direction during Trump years of ending some regulations on global warming. You know, the world is involved with it. But again, it's a leadership issue. And it's literally, I think it's fair to say, the clock is ticking on it. Can the private sector have a role here? or Because it seems that the government is quite gridlocked, particularly in Washington, to do something you know broad, at least in this country. I think there's a lot more consensus um, globally for action. But certainly the government here is very, very mixed and very divided and struggles with putting forth significant solutions. Is this something where other groups, not-for-profits and the private sector need to perhaps step up? Or is this really a government Issue. I think we're actually seeing that. I mean, if you look at companies who are increasingly responsive to their customers and their stakeholders, generally meaning their employees, you see a lot of companies, especially in tech, but increasingly in other industries that are taking the lead where the government hasn't been able to. So I think there's that. I also think that we're talking about this on what may be the eve of Congress passing a huge bill in terms of money anyway, and investment on, on dealing with climate change. Now it's being framed, thanks to Joe Manchin, as an inflation beating bill, great, you know, but there are hundreds of billions of dollars in there for climate change mitigation. Some of that is going to the fossil fuel industry. So the government is paying the private sector to do that. Some of that is going to those of us who would want to buy an electric car, for instance. So I think it's not one or the other, Barb, but I do think that the leadership here for the last 10 years has not been any place in American politics. It has been in the American and private sector, for better or for worse, but I think that's the truth. And, and the worry from the scientific community, of course, is, is this too little, too late? But I would venture to say better something than nothing. So uh, let's see what we can do. One of the things that we poll about is what issues concern Americans. And while it's not a top tier issue, it's not one of the top two or three that we've seen over the last year or two, housing is always an issue that is just bubbling kind of underneath the top three. And we wanted to talk about housing because there's a lot going on in housing right now between what's happening with the economy and the Fed and, and, and interest rates, but also affordable housing for people who are really in the rental market. And strange things are happening. Rent's going one way, you know, mortgages going another way. The post-COVID housing landscape is, I think, a lot different than a lot of people thought maybe going in when there's a lot of disruption. So. We wanted to bring in a guest to help us sort through this. And Emily Badger is a uh, reporter of the New York Times who writes about cities and urban policy, often in the Upshot, which is a, 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 a blog. Did we still call it a blog, Emily, at the Times? Uh, or? You could just call it a, I call it a corner of the Times. A corner. That's very good. A corner of the Times. And you work down the Washington Bureau. Emily, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So help us sort this out. 49% of Americans in a Pew study earlier this year said that availability of affordable housing in their local community is a major problem. That's up 10 points from a couple of years ago. And another 36% say affordable housing is a minor problem. So you add those numbers up and we're up over 80% saying this is an issue, but it doesn't seem to push up to the top three. Is that because we have so many other bigger problems or is this really a big problem that we just don't seem to be able to get our hands around it? So the last two years during the pandemic, as you mentioned, have just been a really, really unusual and crazy time in the housing market. And I think a couple of things are happening that are going to push this issue up the list for many people. One is that, you know, both rents and home prices, if you're buying, have gone up year over year at higher rates than we have ever seen before in many markets. We are talking about rents going up 20% from one year to the next in many places. 
prices. There are markets where home prices have gone up 30% or more from one year to the next. And as that's happening, we're sort of seeing this problem spread in two different directions. One is that it is spreading around the country geographically. So it is impacting people in parts of the country that never felt like they had a housing affordability issue before. And the other thing is that this problem is sort of spreading up the income spectrum. So, you know, it has long been the case that lower income people have struggled with affordable housing all over the country for a very long time. But we are increasingly seeing middle class people. We are seeing young professionals. You know, we are seeing a lot of groups that never sort of considered this to be their problem before. Housing affordability is becoming a problem for them. And, you know, I think this is true. You guys could probably speak to this better than I could. But as problems increasingly affect the middle class, they tend to become more of a political problem. We hear politicians talking about them more. And that's part of what's been happening with housing affordability. You mentioned that it's kind of spreading out now and like we've seen that there's a difference with where people live and housing affordability. So do you think that it's becoming less of a geographical issue of where you live? Yeah. I mean, up until the last couple of years, I think a lot of people could reasonably say to themselves, you know, a severe housing affordability problem is a blue state problem. It is a coastal city problem. If you live in kind of middle America, if you live in a mid-sized city, you know, this isn't something that we deal with. And you could also sort of tell yourself a story if you're in those communities that, you know, this is a problem that is created by cities run by Democrats or by, you you know, states like California that have very liberal policies. But as this problem spreads to other places, it gets a lot harder to tell yourself that story. I mean, this is increasingly a national problem. It is not a coastal city problem. It is not a blue state problem. And do you think like moving forward, are there any solutions that, you know, that can be taken right now to kind of help where we're at? Or where do you think it's going at the moment? Well, the, the really big problem with the housing market is that even as it is becoming a national problem, there are really not a lot of easy national solutions to it because the housing market is so closely shaped by decisions that are made at the local level by rules and zoning restrictions that are made at the local level. So, you know, it's extremely difficult, even though there's growing interest in Washington in this topic, it's extremely difficult for the White House or even for anyone in Congress to say, here is a brilliant idea or a lever that we can pull from the Capitol in order to make housing more affordable or more plentiful around the country. I mean, the best possible thing that could happen at the national level would be for the federal government to say things to local communities. You guys are making it really hard to build housing. You have enacted all of these restrictions that make it difficult. And if you want to participate in federal grant programs, like getting highway dollars from the Department of Transportation, you know, in, in order to get those things, you're going to have to change some of your housing rules and make it easier to build housing. And that kind of idea, which could be powerful, would take many years to play out. And the idea of incentivizing local governments to build more housing and make housing more affordable, like this is a sort of long-term solution. There are very few solutions on the table that are going to fix this problem by the end of the year. Is there any political will to deal with that? Because long-term solutions, we don't have political will to deal with crises that are immediate. It seems like long-term issues are almost beyond our capacity politically to deal with. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two political will problems here. One is the one that you mentioned where, you know, nobody has the ability to come up with a solution. And as a politician, you're going to get rewarded for fixing the housing crisis in the next cycle. But the other issue is that, you know, for all of the difficulty that we're talking about that renters and middle and moderate income people are experiencing, there are people who are benefiting from the trends that we're talking about. If you are a homeowner and you have been living in the same home for 10, 15 years, you are not planning to move to a new home anytime soon. You have benefited enormously from the fact that your property value has increased so much over this time. Like you are building equity and, you know, there are 65% of American households own their own homes. So we're talking about an enormous number of people who are incumbent homeowners who are in some way benefiting from rising prices. And those people are, you know, they are a powerful voting block, particularly at the local level. And they are in effect benefiting from they're not being enough supply. They're benefiting from the shortage of housing. And those people are not, in many cases, are, are not going to be super amenable to supporting local policies that say, let's build lots of apartment buildings in your neighborhood. Can I ask one last question before we go? Gen Z and millennials are the biggest generation in American history. Where, how does that play into this? So this is one of many issues where millennials are going to have a much, much harder time in life than baby boomers are. So they are in particular aging into 
peak home buying years in their 30s, kind of exactly at this moment when the cost of housing is skyrocketing all over the country. And, you know, they are also the fact that they're such a large generation is part of what is driving so much demand at a time when we don't have enough supply. And so I think, you know, millennials and Gen Z coming up behind them, they are going to have a much harder time than their parents did or than their grandparents did, you know, sort of finding the right housing that fits their needs, that they can afford, that fits their budgets, you know, sort of building equity through housing, sort of all of the promise of kind of, you know, a, a single family home as part of the American dream. You know, that dream doesn't look the same to them as it did to baby boomers. Well, Greta, you are part of that generation and maybe you being of that size of generation, if you guys vote, you know, maybe, maybe you could get the stuff changed in housing. The prior generations, myself and Emily's included, have not. You guys could do that. Voting would definitely help. Yeah. Emily Badger from the New York Times, writing in this case, housing, but also writes better policy. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been great, really informative. And I think it helps us frame this issue that is so important to Americans, even if it doesn't always pop to, into the top three, it's certainly one that affects all of us all the time. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much for having a conversation and for inviting me. We call my final segment today, the fun fact segment, and I'm not sure how much fun it is if you go outside it's sizzling in most of the country right now bad enough that the temperature's high uh but then when they say with the humidity it feels like and it's always a higher number it is a, a place to be inside right now however in 1955 as jay indicated at the top as your resident 50 something not age, but I mean, <laughs> experience. Uh, I wish I was 50 you're you're, Yes, you are the child of the 50s. I was a child in the 50s, yes. but And so I don't remember 1955 that well, but I am told from the numbers it was hot. And people were asked by Gallup poll in 1955 whether they'd ever had seen a summer as hot as that one. And 44 said yes, and 53 said no. What I find interesting about that, of course, is if you asked it in a era of what for lack of a better phrase, it's global warming. My guess is you get bigger numbers. And in fact, in 1955, the average temperature in the summer in Chicago was 76 degrees. In 2022, this year, they estimate it at 82, which is an increase. I don't even need my fingers for this one of six yeah. degrees. No, you needed both hands. Yeah, I need both hands. That's true. You know um, what I love about this, though, Lee, is if you look at what this poll was titled, it was a Gallup poll on politics, Russia, and China. And then they ask a question about a hot summer. Uh, time warp. Has anything changed? I mean, that could be the title of a poll right now. At the time, I do believe the summer of 1955 was the hottest summer on record, but we certainly have gotten past those numbers and set new records along the way. How many uh, of you guys had air conditioning in your houses when you were growing up? Not no. Many. No, no. We, we, we actually lived in the country and there were usually, there was usually probably two really hot weeks in July. And other than that, there was yeah. always, always a pleasant breeze. We and, had a uh, big window fan. That was so <laughs> oh, we had we lived, we lived on the water and we would open the windows. And my uncle was a big believer in cross ventilation. So that was our uh, air conditioning. Yes, yes. The science of cross ventilation. I remember it well. My grandparents had a little bedroom in Brooklyn and the window was always open a couple inches. And there was always, I'm told, a nice breeze coming in. I'd never detected it, but, but think about today, you know, going the whole summer without air conditioning, that would not no, be. Some possible. people still do some that. Do. And so the temperatures have risen or rising. It's yeah. not a fun topic in many parts of the country because it has had some deadly consequences yeah, so. because of the extreme heat. So we have to find a way to make fun facts more fun, I think. That's it for Poll Hub this week. Poll Hub is a production of the Marist Poll at Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Mary Griffith is our executive producer. Casey Schaff is our production supervisor. The Poll Hub team includes Greta Stuckey, Mike Bowler, and Will Promiso. If you enjoy Poll Hub, please consider leaving us a review. Positive reviews help other listeners like you find us. If you'd like to learn more about polling and survey science, check out the Marist Poll Academy, our free online learning portal. If you have questions for us, tweet them at us at Maris Poll. Remember, you can always tell your smart speaker to play Poll Hub. And with any luck, 
it will cooperate. Finally, wherever you listen to Pull Up, there is a subscribe button. Click it and the latest episode will be ready for you in your podcasting app as soon as it's released. We'll, we'll see you next time. time.